So Gen X is the next generation that comes after the boomers. They're often called the forgotten generation, or they're the post-boomers, or they're the, um, the baby busters. Um, they often consider themselves the forgotten generation because when people talk about generations, they talk about the boomers and the, and the millennials and the zenials, and everybody's like, hello, don't forget the Gen X here. Um, even though I'm technically what we call a second wave baby boomer, I was born in 1963, I, I relate much more to Generation X in terms of the formative events, the way that I think about things, um, the way that I see the world is much more through the lens of Gen X than, I, than it is through um, the, the boomer generation. But anyway, I digress. So the most important events for these folks is the global energy crisis where people remember going to odd and even lines, odd days, if you had an odd number in your license plate, um, at the last number of your license plate, even days, if it's an even number in your license plate, and you could only get gas on those days, so they, they had to truly um, uh, manage that as best as they could because, um, you know, we had a global, global crisis um, um, going on in the Middle East. Um, not providing um, the oil uh, to us to be able to make gasoline. Um, personal computers were starting to be big. Uh, people were having, you know, computers with dual floppy disks, big five and a half inch floppy disks. Sitting on their desks, you had to put one boot, one disk in to boot up your computer, then you'd pull it out and then you'd load in your software uh, that you wanted to use. Um, you know, maybe WordPerfect or Lotus123, and I'm dating myself because I remember those things. You know, I remember getting a two megabyte hard drive on my computer and thinking that was epic and I would never use all of it. And now, of course, we're into the gigas and the, and the, and the, and the, and the uh, you know, gigabyte size and, um, and other sizes that are just beyond comprehension about how much space there is. Other things that influenced this generation, Three Mile Island and Chernobyl, nuclear accidents. And this is where people are starting to get fearful of nuclear war, nuclear, um, nuclear power plants. What is that going to, to do for our world and, and what threat we lived under and, you know, in, the, in that Cold War sort of era before the, the, before the wall collapsed in the late 80s. Um, corporate layoffs were starting to be big now because as the economy changed and as we had much more competition going on from foreign countries like Japan and China um, and Europe um, post-World War II, as those countries rebuilt and were able to go out and, um, uh, and sell products and try to compete, um, we realized that our way of doing things was not helping. We were too big. We were too uh, paternalistic, you know, going back to earlier information. We, um, we had too many layers to be able to make quick decisions and we could not compete. So those layoffs were a new and novel thing that companies that had always um, had a paternalistic perspective like IBM and AT&T, um, they did not believe in corporate layoffs. Um, so that was um, originally, and, and now having to do that, they really had to change their culture and change the way they did work. Um, there was an economic recession, of course, in the late 80s that was also pretty formative. Not as difficult as 2008, but definitely enough that we, we had to take a step back, take a gasp and figure out what are we going to do next. Um, and then, as we said, that wall came down in the late 80s. Um, I think it was 1989, if I recall correctly. Um, and it was the end of communism. At least we thought it was the end of communism. Obviously, the Soviet Union disappeared. The Eastern Bloc disappeared. Uh, Russia was in really bad straits for a long period of time. But they have risen up, you know, not in a, in a very positive way, but they've certainly risen up, you know, in, since that time when they collapsed. And, and it's, it's a very different game than it was in the late 80s with Mikhail Gorbachev and his willingness to, uh, to work with the United States, to accept help from the United States, to build a relationship with the United States. And that's not what Putin is doing now for obvious reasons as we are yet in year two of a war in the Ukraine. Um, so the biggest cautionary lesson that I think this generation learned is that leaders can fail. 
leaders will fail and leaders cannot be trusted. We looked at R Richard Nixon. Um, we looked at people like Jimmy Swaggart and, and Jim Baker, who were televangelists taking advantage of people. And they were at that beginning of that rise of evangelical Christianity that sort of entered into politics. And all of these leaders, uh, Swaggart and Baker, for example, were corrupt. They were taking money from people who, um, who had very little money. Um, and they lived in, lavishly while many of their followers lived in poverty. Um, and they, they misappropriated funds. They acted inappropriately. They engaged in sexual behaviors that were inappropriate for religious leaders. Um, and sort of the, all that cynicism that, you know, that many Gen X people have about leadership is, comes from that. Watching these people that we were supposed to look up to and follow and recognize that they were, they were flawed human beings and that they were, um, that we needed to be more cautious about that. Um, these, the Gen X folks were latchkey kids. They are the children of divorce. And so they oftentimes were being raised by single parents and they needed to, um, to have a key to come home at the end of school, to put food on the table for siblings, to clean the house, to do the chores. Um, they were used to being by themselves with the doors locked and you don't answer the phone and you don't go, you know, you don't answer the door. You just basically go home and you do your homework and you wait for mom or dad to come home from work um, so you can continue on with your day. Um, Gen X is really good at managing chaos and understanding and being comfortable in chaos. So Gen X is like, we're so used to it, we don't even think about it. Um, and I think that's why, you know, for me, um, I am very comfortable in a, in a more chaotic, changing environment because I recognize things are not predictable always. Things are not stable always. Um, and it is really important for us to be able to adapt on a dime as new things get thrown at us. Generally speaking, Gen X is very self-reliant. They like measurable results. They're not worried about process. They're worried about outcomes. That's what matters. Like processes can be streamlined, but what they want is something that's very results driven. It's like, I don't care how you do it as long as you do it within the boundaries of the law and ethics, you get that thing done. So they, they were the beginning of the flexibility movement. And I think that's why for many of them as leaders now in many of these organizations, um, as the boomers are aging out, the, 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 the top leadership now tends to be Gen X. They're people my age and younger, so they're in their 50s and 60s. And, and they are now the ones that are leading organizations. And so they're the ones that are embracing this notion of being flexible and having flexible schedules and making these things work. Some of the most important messages to Gen Xers are don't count on people or don't count on things, that there are no such things as heroes. And maybe that's why we all like, you know, the, the, um, the, the uh, Marvel Universe, right? You know, because they're heroes in a real sense of the word, but uh, we know that that's fantasy and it doesn't really happen on, you know, here in reality, that there are no superheroes coming to save us. Um, we want people to be realistic, not fantastic. Um, in the way that they view things. And, and the important thing is no one's going to take care of you but you, so you need to take care of yourself. Um, and, the, and, and Gen Xers are always good about asking the why question. Why do I have to do that? I'm not going to do it just for the sake of doing it. I want to know why it matters. And as I already said, the, the technology that really drove Gen X was personal computers. Um, the PC was just revolutionary. Um, and none of us believe that it would take off the way it is. Now I have a personal computer in my pocket with my smartphone. Um, but I will tell you in 1985 when I was using a computer um, for the first time, um, it was um, um, pretty stunning to, um, uh, to, to find that I could actually have a computer in my, in my uh, pants pocket if I wanted to. So next are millennials, the first and second wave. Um, they're the digital generation, the boomlets, the Nintendo generation, the internet generation. Um, they were um, the, probably one of the first generations to be using uh, computers on a regular basis. I wouldn't say that millennials were 
the the true digital uh, children because many of them didn't really have, get access to computers until they were you know in their you know elementary school and perhaps even in high school, um, but they were exposed to it at an early enough age that they were much more comfortable to it comfortable with it, so um, they are the 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 birth of the internet right the use of the internet. Um, I'll remember in when I started grad school in the mid 90s, early 90s, 93 is when I started my doctoral program and people were talking about this thing called the Internet and how you could, you know, you could use Netscape to surf the web and to see these different websites and there weren't many websites out there at the time. Um, but being able to surf the web and to see all these different um, websites and businesses that were being offered. This was also part of the, um, you know, the digital businesses and seeing how people could make money using the Internet. I'll never forget my brother-in-law, who, by the way, was instrumental in, in, in doing, he was the chief, in, chief, um, um, chief technology officer for Pearson Prentice Hall. And he, he, you know, this, the, the, he handled all the information technology. He dealt with Y2K and the challenges of making sure the computers um, were all going to be in alignment. I mean, he was a CIO. He was a chief information officer, chief technology officer in a company. And I remember him very distinctly saying, I don't think we're ever going to really make money off the Internet. Ha. Um, he totally um, was wrong. <laughs> And he admitted it, too. He's like, yeah, I was wrong on that one. But he clearly uh, did not think that the Internet would make money for people. So millennials are part of that generation. Their, their first computers were usually in the, you know, in the early years, in their, in their elementary years. They weren't born with a computer in their hands, but clearly as close to it as they could. Some of those formative events, all of those ethics scandals were huge. Enron, WorldCom. Um, the World Trade Center bombings that happened, and, and we're not talking about 9-11. There was a World Trade Center bombing that happened probably about 10-ish mm, years, maybe. Um, maybe it was 92, I think it was 92, um, uh, where uh, there was a bomb that, took, that went off in the World Trade Center Tower. It didn't create as much damage um, as they had hoped, um, and, that, and I suspect that's one of the motivations why they came back in 2001 to, to kind of finish the job. But Oklahoma City bombing, Columbine shootings, um, Gulf Wars, Hurricane Katrina, you know, um, the threat of terrorism, the threat of the unknown enemy. Um, this was scary, and it still is scary, because um, we just don't know. Going to school and never knowing if you're going to be able to come home, you know, if there's going to be somebody shooting you. And I know this is something that our... Um, our kids struggle with in terms of mental health and, and feeling safe in schools. Um, they were a very busy generation. They were very programmed. Their parents, you know, um, were called soccer moms. Um, they, many of them, <coughs> excuse me, did not necessarily work, but they, you know, they, you know, they toted their kids from extracurricular to extracurricular. They had them programmed to the teeth. They had them doing all multiple things and then putting pressure on them to go to college and what it's going to look like when you go to college and get into the best schools. And, and so this whole notion of filling our kids with so much extracurriculars to keep them busy um, was a big challenge, you know, for parents at that time. And certainly is a challenge for millennials who struggle with, you know, maybe feeling like they should be doing something all the time rather than just chillaxing and relaxing. And understand, you know, these kids, uh, their parents are probably boomers. Many of them are boomers. Some may be early Gen X, but largely they're boomers. Um, and and what did that mean, right, for them? Because their parents were always like, go busy, go better, we want things better, and, and keeping them programmed and busy, and that's what boomers wanted to do. So we see that passed down from generation to generation. Millennials grew up feeling like there is an e they had an egalitarian relationship with adults. 
Many of them would hang out with adults and not with young kids their own age. Um, even though they were involved in extracurriculars, they would spend a lot of social time with adults. They believed that they were on par with their parents. There wasn't the same authoritarian style in terms of you know raising your children as you saw with traditionalists and boomers. Um, they were very casually exposed to multiculturalism. This is the first generation that really didn't think twice about having you know friends who were different races, different sexual orientations. Um, they're much more comfortable and accepting of diversity and differences. Um, they are very goal and achievement oriented. Think about that related to all the extracurriculars and getting into the best schools. Um, and so that is, is tied into that. Um, they believe in social responsibility. This is, is a generation that really started to care about this. And again, very likely influenced by their um, early Gen X and late boomer parents. Um, that they cared about, um, you know, social justice issues. Um, you know, their parents were, you know, marched to fight the Vietnam War. So why wouldn't they learn from them to do the same? Um, they started, they have really taken off the use of social media. Everything pretty much is shared online. The whole idea of selfies and things like that really came out of millennials. Um, and some of the very compelling messages, right? You're special. No one gets left behind. Everybody should be, you know, everybody plays, everybody wins. Um, and, you know, there's some pros to that because it really helps with self-esteem. But the con is people didn't learn how to not be successful. They didn't learn that they weren't always going to be good at things and that they didn't learn grit and resilience to deal with issues. And this is a broad generalization, obviously, because it's not true of all or most gen millennials. But generationally, you know, these are some of the concerns that we hear much more prevalent now dealing with, you know, this generation is that in, in some ways there was not a lot of resilience that they were taught. They were taught to basically, you know, do what their parents told them to do and, and, um, and that everything was great, you know, what they did. Um, so, you know, they were connected 24-7. They always got, you know, a phone or a computer or an iPad or something feeling connected all the time. Um, they are all about achieving. Um, and being very goal-oriented and achieving, um, and also balancing that with giving back to their communities. The internet was their big thing, clearly. Um, the, the internet is the thing that really had a huge impact on millennials. So our Gen Z um, is the last generation that's just beginning to enter the workforce. They are the true digital natives, much more so than millennials. These are the ones that really from birth, technology has just been an important part of their life, whether it's smart TVs or smart refrigerators or, you know, hey Alexa or hey Siri. I mean, this is just something that they are all learned and taught um, very clearly. Um, and I just looked down at my phone and it started to, to flash because, you know, I said, hey, Siri, you know, of course it was like, oh, how can I serve you, master? Um, anyway, joking aside, some of the most important events that really framed our Gen X uh, folks was the 2008 housing crisis, economic collapse, the GM bailouts, um, and some of those things that were pretty egregious, probably 9-11 Maybe Gen Z remembers it, but more likely the millennials remember 9-11 more so than anything else. That was a huge formative event for them. Um, iPhones or smartphones were big. Um, the first black president, which was really, maybe we look at it now with a little jaded you know, uh, point of view, but the first black president was pretty epic. Given that you know, in the 60s, we were barely providing civil rights to people who had different skin colors from those who were white. Um, so that was a pretty uh, formative uh, event. Climate change issues is big for them. And then also the Donald Trump presidency, how the backlash from having a black president brought in Donald Trump, who really did not like Barack Obama at all, um, constantly attacked him while he was in office, um, and created tremendous tensions. Um, the Me Too movement was also very big here in terms of we're not going to take being abused and treated inappropriately, um, you know, with sexual harassment. Now, mind you, 
sexual harassment for all intents and purposes was outlawed in the 1964 Civil Rights Act when we added women to those areas that were protected. And it really took into the 70s and even into the 80s before we had some laws and guidelines that said sexual harassment is wrong. And then in the 90s, it took us to have, you know, Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas and the tailhook incidents um, that, that really highlighted, no, this is incorrect and we should not be treating people this way. And it still took until the late, you know, 20 teens for people to stand up and say, yeah, I've been harassed, me too, me too, me too. And that Me Too movement really took off and made a huge difference in the way that we think about um, handling social justice issues and sexual harassment issues and things like that. Black Lives Matter is also huge for this group. Because remember, this is the time, you know, 10, I think it was how many years ago? 10 years ago, is it already? You know, um, the killing of, um, um, you know, in, in Ferguson and the riots in Ferguson um, uh, and, and, and how that um, influenced um, the movements that we saw in the summer of 2020 when um, George Floyd was killed by the police um, and the outrage and the upheaval that happened because of that. So we're starting to see people really take notice of, of racial inequities um, and trying to, to make sense of them and to fix them. And then, of course, you know, for many, um, um, the COVID pandemic, they were probably in high school or maybe a little younger. Um, but the COVID pandemic has really influenced the way that they see themselves in the workplace and the way that they um, kind of manage their lives. I mean, it was a huge issue and it still creates mental health issues for many people and, and we're you know supposedly on the outside of the this this pandemic it's not considered a pandemic anymore it's more endemic meaning it's just going to be with us forever and it's there's nothing we can do to make that virus go away um we can vaccine we can adapt like we do to the flu um or things like that but really the COVID pandemic as a, as a major issue seems to be waning a bit and and the mental health problems are still there. We're seeing kids who went to school, you know, during the pandemic are more likely to skip school. They're not they're not motivated to go. They they are they feel safer and more protected underneath, you know, the 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 the, the, the four walls of their and the roof of their home. Um, rather than going out and interacting. And so this is a big concern. Um, and obviously, you know, that's in many ways why they like flexible work, you know, ideas. But also these Gen Z kids are the children of Gen X kids, right? The Gen X generation. And Gen X was the group that really liked to have flexible work. They really cared about that. Um, and that passes down to their Gen Z children, um, you know, in terms of thinking about things in those manners. So in terms of communication preferences, this is really important to know. Our traditionalists prefer memos and letters and handwritten notes. These are really important to them. So if you've got grandparents who are traditionalists, um, writing them a letter or sending them a card or a postcard means the world to them. So keep that in mind. My mother still handwrites cards and handwrites letters to people. She just loves doing that and she's you know in her 80s. Um, boomers are all about their phones and personal interaction. They like to interact with people face to face. Um, Gen Xers are all about emails and voicemails. Like you, you asked me to talk to you on the phone or talk to you face to face. I'd much rather just leave you a voicemail, <laughs> give you all the details you need. You can always call me back if we need to. But I'm also willing to put in a very detailed email, things that I want somebody to know um, in how those things work out. Um, so, you know, Gen Xers were sort of at that cutting edge of using technology um, and digital technology, emails and, 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 and Internet and things like that um, as a means of communication. Our millennials are the blogs, the instant messages, the text messages, communicating in that manner was much more prevalent for millennials. Gen Z is a little split. So some of it's that back to basics things that really matters to them. The idea of being face to face, 
um, and, 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 and being mentored one-on-one -on -one with a boss is so important to them. And, and at the same time, social media, things like Reddit and, um, and, and Instagram and Snapchat, all of these things, you know, fleeting and it's no big deal. So they're comfortable kind of with, with a foot in both places. They're good with the face-to-face -face communication, but they're also good using social media. Although many of these Gen Zs and even millennials don't really care about things like Facebook and stuff like that. Um, it's, it's us Gen Xers that, that are loving the, the, idea, the idea of staying connected to each other through social media in that manner. Um, but our, our Gen Z folks, you know, they don't think about it in the same way. And in fact, our Gen Z folks are more likely to do online gaming and the, the multiplayer, massive multiplayer online role play games. And, and they are working digitally with each other. And there's research that I've been working on about how we can learn really good digital, digital competencies while working, um, um, while working on the, um, uh, you know, uh, while playing games, we can learn those digital com competencies. So it's kind of fun. What are some important management don'ts? Number one, for traditionalists, don't be touchy feely. Don't worry about you know being trendy or things like that. They don't care about those things. They want things to be very organized, very predictable. If you're indecisive, it frustrates them. And they often will see when things are uncertain, seeing you being indecisive, they see what you, the challenges you have making a decision under uncertainty as being indecisive. And in, in fact, in, in, a, in a situation under uncertainty, um, as many of you should have learned already in management and BA 522, if you took that class, I know a few of you probably haven't, but um, man, making decisions under uncertainty, it's incredibly difficult to make quick snap decisions because we really don't know what we don't know. Um, and if we do make the decisions, they may not necessarily be the best decisions, but we're making them nonetheless. Um, Boomers don't like bureaucracy. They grew up with bureaucratic organizations and the destruction of bureaucratic organizations, and they don't like bureaucracy. They don't like red tape. They don't like taking layers upon layers to make decisions. They get really angry when you don't hear their input. They want to be heard um, deeply. Um, they don't like it when you treat them like their voice doesn't matter. Uh, Gen Z hates being micromanaged. They are so used to being so independent that the last thing they need is somebody sitting over top of them telling them what to do and how to do it. This is very frustrating to Gen Zs. Um, they want to make sure that if you're going to say you're going to do something, you better do it. So practice what you preach. If you're saying you value X, you better do X. And if you don't, this is a problem. Um, they believe that results matter. So don't forget results. And, and don't schmooze. They are not big schmoozers. They don't like schmoozing. They understand that it needs to be done on occasion, um, but they're not the schmoozers, not like the boomers. Boomers like schmoozing. Millennials um, don't like cynicism, sarcasm, and that's very likely because the Gen Xers are pretty cynical and sarcastic. Um, Again, remember, these are the Gen Xers are people that grew up with people who said that they were going to be great leaders and then disappointed all of us. And so they are a little cynical about things, um, but they don't like cynicism. They really want you to be predictable. Um, they have a lot of self-confidence. They do not want to believe that they are too young to do something. And in some circumstances, they might be, but not in all circumstances. For us to say, you're too young, you're too this, you're too that, you don't know enough, um, Every generation says that to the generation before them. They're, they're too young. They're not experienced enough. They don't understand this. Um, millennials uh, are, don't want you to be threatened by technology. It's like if you're if you're a person that's like, oh, I hate technology. They're gonna laugh at you. You know, they're gonna be like, yeah, no, this is not how the world works, and it's time you get get on the bandwagon. They don't like people being condescending to them. They don't like anybody who's inconsistent or disorganized. They really like more predictability, more consistency in the way things are handled. Our Gen Zs are telling us, don't ignore workers. They value good coaching and good leadership and good participative leadership. They value good relationships with their leaders. They don't want you to forget them, to forget to coach them. They want coaching. They seek your input. They want to learn from you. 
Um, and, and they want flexibility. That rigid schedule thing, you must be here because of FaceTime, they don't care about that. We care about it. They don't. And so it's important for us to recognize and that as a challenge and how difficult it's going to be to get people on board for that. So here's what remains the same. Every generation thinks the one behind them is more lazy, more unfocused, doesn't share their values, is so inexperienced, it's not worth it. And they don't like their hair, their music, or their clothes, right? If you doubt this, you can go ahead and do research on newspapers going back a hundred years to see, oh, the new generation, they're not willing to learn. Oh, they don't like to work hard. It's just what we do. We believe our generation, who we are, the way that we see the world is the right way. And what we have to recognize as a form of diversity is that each generation has a unique gift to give. And it's our job as leaders, as managers, to tap into that. So knowing how these multi-generational workforces are going to operate, knowing what the strengths and weaknesses are of these generations, knowing how to appeal to them to get the most out of them is really what our goal is going to be. And recognize that mentoring is good, particularly what we call bi-directional mentoring. This notion that um, there's upward, there's downward mentoring, but there's also upward mentoring. That millennials and, and, and our Gen Zs, our Xenials, right, can help our Gen Xs and our boomers to learn something new about new technology and new ways to do things. So that's our goal at the end of the day.